In the spring of 1945, an embattled Japan was gearing up to shock the USA with a nightmarish fighting tactic. In Europe, a desperate Adolf Hitler was going insane in his bunker. Meanwhile, in the USA, the president had very hard decisions to make. Does he sign off on dropping weapons of mass destruction on Japan? Weapons which his chief of staff said were so barbarous they showed an ethical standard of barbarians from the Dark Ages? It was not an easy decision to make, which we think you'll agree with by the time you got to the end of this show. That spring, the Japanese finally had been beaten in Burma, but the country was in no way done in the Pacific. Japan would not concede defeat, and never mind what it took, it would fight to the bitter end. As March came to a close, the US forces had secured the island of Iwo Jima, but not without considerable loss of life. To capture this tiny island, no bigger than a third of Manhattan, 7,184 American soldiers died, and another 24,000 US soldiers were injured. The Americans were now entirely superior to the Japanese in almost all military capacities. As the war historian Max Hastings notes, at this point Japan was suffering death from a thousand cuts. He also said that while Japan's defeat was assured, the country's military leaders would not accept that. What Japan's generals wanted was for the war to end on their terms, which seems ridiculous given the weak position they were in. But they had an idea. Make sure that for everything gained by the US, there would be massive blood loss. Show the Americans that they would have to fight tooth and nail, and if a land invasion of the Japanese mainland should happen, let the Americans know that it'll cost lots and lots of American lives. As you'll see, the very sincere stubbornness led to one of the most controversial military tactics of all time. Time. With this plan in mind, Japan struck quickly, mounting a series of devastating air attacks on the US Navy. It wouldn't be enough, however, and soon after, Major General Curtis LeMay issued the command to strike Tokyo. 325 bombers flew low over the city, dropping so many bombs in such quick succession the place resembled flaming hell. Only 12 of those bombers didn't come back, but that was only because they were caught in the updrafts from the fires. Such success was uncommon. An American soldier said Tokyo looked like Dante's Inferno. He wrote back home saying fires were everywhere and the destruction brought this night could have been nothing less than catastrophic. 100,000 Japanese residents were killed in the Tokyo bombing and about a million people lost their homes and around a million suffering injuries. Then, American B-29 bombers hit other cities, causing mass destruction and death in places such as Osaka and Kobe. Japanese planes couldn't stop the attacks. It was an absolute massacre. Then, the Japanese used their dark ace in the hole. They used pilots to fly their planes into American planes and ships. Yeah, you've heard of this tactic. They were called kamikaze pilots. A word which in Japanese means the divine wind. That's what the pilots thought they were doing, acting as divine agents to save their homeland from a not-so-divine Americans. Many of these pilots volunteered, but many others were reluctant to fly to their deaths. Some barely had any flying experience and were just out of high school. One such young man said, We have to go to the battlefield to die without being able to express our opinions, criticize, and argue. To die at the demand of the nation. I have no intention whatsoever to praise it. It is a great tragedy. Japanese cities had already been reduced to ash. Millions upon millions of people had been injured and displaced. The air raids may have killed 400,000, but some estimates say 900,000. As for military deaths, during those bombing campaigns, one American soldier died for every 100 Japanese. By May, Hitler had already expired in his bunker, along with his new wife and his beloved mutt, Blondie. Germany was done, and the Soviets were doing their very worst in those cities to the surviving civilian population. But the Japanese would not give up. Once they started using kamikaze pilots, their success rates improved, despite how awful this form of fighting was. When the US invaded Okinawa, the Japanese hit back with these pilots, and suddenly the US Navy started taking a hammering. The US public, seeing the war in Europe was over, didn't like hearing that American boys were going up in flames. Those kamikaze pilots were doing so much more damage because they rarely missed their target. It also helped that because those planes were destined for destruction, they could be stripped down of parts and not fully filled with precious fuel. The executive officer of the USS Essex, Fitzhugh Lee, said some of his boys were in a state of wild panic because of the Japanese one-way missions. Those minutes would seem like years, he said, about seeing the blip in the sky coming toward the ship. We had a few who lost control of themselves and started weeping, crying, praying, Lee said. All of this is very important when you try to understand why the US dropped these two atomic bombs on Japan. One Japanese kamikaze pilot wrote to his mom, proud of what he was going to do. He said, I will do a splendid job sinking an enemy aircraft carrier. Do brag about me. His name was Hayashi Ichizo, and indeed, that was his last letter. He died off of Okinawa at just 23 years old. Other such pilots stated in letters that they would defeat the Americans and the British and they would die with pride doing it. How do you beat such a force of will? 27 American ships were sunk during the time, which was devastating for the US. If a Japanese pilot set off on a mission, he had a 20% chance of hitting his target and causing massive damage to man and machine. This tactic was 10 times more destructive than regular attacks. On June 22nd, the Americans were 
reported over 7,000 Army and Marines dead, plus another 5,000 Navy personnel dead. Over 50,000 soldiers were injured, some very seriously. Japan was having success, so the generals still believed this could force the US to bring agreeable terms to the table. Little did those generals know what was in store for them. As they made plans to send more men to certain death, British scientists who'd been ahead in the atomic bomb-making department had already joined the Manhattan Project in America. The atomic bomb was ready to go, but oh god, dropping that thing was an ethical conundrum. One of those scientists, Edward Teller, wrote to a colleague, saying, I have no hope of clearing my conscience. The things we're working on are so terrible that no amount of protesting or fiddling with politics will save our souls. But US planes pretty much crippled Japanese industry. There were hardly any more industrial targets to destroy. Now it was just about killing civilians, women, children, old folks. Some people who didn't agree with the war, who hated war. But if you think for a minute that even with that kind of carnage, Japan was going to back down, you'd be very wrong. During all this chaos and the loss of life and industry, here's what Chief of General Staff Yoshijiro Yumeza said in a newspaper story in May. The sure path to victory in a decisive battle lies in uniting the resources of the empire and getting behind the war effort, and in mobilizing the full strength of the nation, both physical and spiritual, to annihilate the American invaders. No doubt, many people in the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki read that, and likely many of them read those words with a sense of pride, determination, and hope. They could have no idea what was coming to them. Murderous weapons, cynically named Fat Man and Little Boy. Weapons that would cause more destruction than they thought possible in their wildest nightmares. Still, many of them may have picked up one of the 63 million leaflets the Americans dropped over Japan, saying things like, we cannot promise that only these cities will be among those attacked. They just didn't know how they were going to be attacked. Not many people knew just how destructive those bombs were. A British commander of the Sefton, named Michael Bloybrook, wrote, just after the bombing, we heard about some wonder bomb that had been dropped on Japan, which was going to stop the war. We really took no notice, thinking that one single bomb wasn't going to alter the course of history. That's the thing, not many people knew how deadly these things were. The Japanese certainly didn't know what was around the corner. In terms of the ethics of dropping bombs, many people now ask why at least didn't the Americans send an explicit threat? Still, would those Japanese generals have backed down? You already know just how intransigent they were. To them, many Japanese soldiers and to many people in Japan, they were still fighting that divine war. It's likely they'd have ensured that war went on and on in spite of the massive loss of Japanese life. If that had happened, back home in America report after report would have detailed depressing statistics about the loss of American lives. In early August, a 19-year-old American gunner named Joseph Majeski was on the Pacific island of Tinian when he saw the delivery of a B-29 bomber named Enola Gay. He noticed that it had been modified, so he asked what the purpose of it was and why it was in Tinian. A crew member looked him in the eye and said, matter-of-factly, we're here to win the war. The first bomb, Little Boy, was dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th and Fat Man hit Nagasaki three days later. Had the Japanese not surrendered on August 15th, a third bomb would likely have been dropped on Tokyo. But the devastation caused in Japan was so great that even those incorrigible generals had to accept defeat. Some Japanese soldiers remarked that they could never imagined such a thing, but those bombs were also something they could have never imagined. Somewhere between 129,000 and 226,000 died in both cities, with as many as 240,000 people dying later from the effects of the bombs. The vast majority of casualties were of course civilians. As awful as that was, when the US estimated what damage would be caused if it attempted a land invasion, it said 400,000 to 800,000 Allied soldiers, American and British, would likely die. It's also believed such an invasion would cost the lives of 5 to 10 million Japanese. Now, we need to talk about a man named Joseph Stalin, the well-read murderous maniac that ruled the Soviet Union. He was actually one of Time Magazine's Men of the Year long before he became an enemy of the USA. Good old Stalin fighting the Germans. But if you read any biography about Stalin, you can see that he had hopes of communism spreading all over the world, with Russia at the head of things. In fact, he had hoped at the start of the war that powerful nations would be weakened by the fighting and he would clean up later. As you know, that didn't happen because Adolf Hitler had his own ideas about world domination, and those jet black precious thoughts of his included getting rid of the darn commies. Stalin's Red Army invaded Japanese-controlled Manchuria on August 9th, the same day as the second atomic bomb dropped. Japan had in past hoped Stalin would not turn against it. The two countries had signed a pact in 1941, but after the Yalta and Tehran conferences, Stalin promised the Brits and Americans that once Germany had fallen, he'd help beat Japan. This apparently came as a bit of a shock to the Japanese generals, who had hoped in 1945 that the Soviets would help broker peace with reasonable terms with the Allies. So even if Japan had carried on fighting with the Americans and then the British and pretty much been devastated, there would have also been the Soviets to deal with. Japan would have been fighting on so many fronts and things would have gone really bad 
bad for the country. So, had those bombs not dropped, you could have expected extreme loss of life. The Americans would have lost many more men too. We don't want to sound in support of the use of nuclear weapons. Those things being used on Japan was a sad indictment of the human race. But when the Japanese generals said they would fight to the death, we think they were not blowing hot air. On the very day the bomb hit Nagasaki, Deputy Chief of Staff of the Imperial Japanese Army, Toroshiro Kawabe wrote, To continue fighting will mean death, but to make peace with the enemy will mean ruin. But we have no choice but to seek life in death, with the determination to have the entire Japanese people perish with the homeland as their deathbed pillow by continuing to fight. We think there is no doubt then that the Americans and the Brits would have gone through with the land invasion called Operation Downfall, and a downfall it would have been for Japan, as you already know, but with considerable loss of life for the Allies too. The US knew only too well from experience that Japanese fighters were willing to walk to certain death and that the country had a fanatically hostile population. Meanwhile, Stalin's army might have marched farther and possibly taken the entire peninsula of Korea. Some historians think the entirety of Korea would have ended up communist and possibly also a bit of Japan. The Americans and the British, knowing the consequences, would have started a beef with Stalin. So the world would have looked like a different place. You also have to realize that the USA would still have had those bombs. And later, the Soviets and then the British. There wouldn't have been a taboo about them, no horrid photos of their destruction. So you have to ask if they'd have been used later, maybe in Vietnam, maybe as a result of Cold War. It doesn't bear thinking about what would have happened if they'd been used during those panic-stricken, paranoid years of the Cold War. As we said, it was a sad and shameful thing that happened to Japan, but what could have happened later might have been worse in terms of loss of life. And anyway, as we've shown you, the land invasion of Japan would have been its own kind of horror. It's a controversial thing to say, but perhaps it was the right thing to do, especially looking in hindsight. But obviously, the best thing that could have happened is that Japan had surrendered earlier, possibly after Truman had done the right thing and fully explained what was coming. Sure, Leaflet said prompt and utter destruction was on the way, but Japan just thought that was already in the cards with all the normal bombs. We'll leave the last words to the historian Max Hastings, whose brilliant research helped us write this show. Almost all of those who participated, nations and individuals alike, made moral compromises. It is impossible to dignify the struggle as an unalloyed contest between good and evil, or rationally celebrate an experience or even an outcome which imposed so much misery on so many. Amen. Now, you need to watch What If World War I Never Happened, or visit the fictional future and why it would suck to live through the end of the universe.